was invited by the most popular kid in third grade, Michelle Kincaid, to her house after school. Now, Michelle was so popular that she told us the Beatles had written the song Michelle for her. <laughs> and we believed her. Who wouldn't write a song for Michelle Kincaid? So I went to her house. She had the pixie cut, you know, um, and a little romper thing. You know, I was still wearing, like, kilt skirts and, you know, my glasses, and, you know, knee socks that fell down. So I'm trudging behind this little sprite. And we get to her house in the new part of town. I lived in the immigrant, Italian immigrant neighborhood, where in the morning when I left for school and I had to go kiss my grandmother and great-grandmother goodbye, they were slaughtering rabbits and chickens for dinner. And their aprons were covered in blood. And I had to kiss them goodbye. And I would just cry, you know? Because I thought I should be living with Samantha from Bewitched. To me, that was like the house that would make me happiest. Anyway, I go to Michelle Kincaid's house, and um, I walk in. It is a split ranch. And I thought, oh my goodness, architecture has peaked. I mean, you walk in downstairs. <laughs> like, what? And then we climb these stairs, and we're in the kitchen. And all I can see is wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. It's like mauve, and then it's um, powder blue, and then a color that, you know, in my innocence, I thought was brown, but Michelle told me was espresso, way down there. <laughs> and I'm just dazzled, you know. And, uh, and then I said, what is that? There is a machine in the corner of the kitchen chugging away noisily. And Michelle said, it's a dishwasher. Now remember, I didn't even have a furnace, you know. So I said, what does it do? <laughs> she said, it washes our dishes. And she's like looking at her watch, like, is it time for you to go home? And then her grandmother appears, right out of central casting. Little bun, little wire rim glasses, apron, no blood. <laughs> Platter of snickerdoodles. Cinnamon just, you know, it fills the kitchen. And I get so jealous that I get a stomach ache. And I say, I have to go. And I run all the way home. And I run in, you know, I go in the kitchen. And my grandmother, Mama Rose, is standing there stirring something like one of the witches from Macbeth. She, <laughs> She mutters, you know, something in Italian. I yell, I hate my life. I run upstairs and I write my first short story. And it is about a little girl who comes home and her grandmother has mysteriously vanished. And the little girl's life gets so much better. She gets a dishwasher and a lifetime supply of snickerdoodles. And I wrote that story, and I came downstairs, and I swear to you, it looked like the entire room had shifted, just from the power of writing a story. Everything looked different, including Mama Rose, including dinner, including my parents. And I understood somehow that I could read if I wanted to escape, but by writing a story, I could help myself understand the world in which I lived. And that dual source of comfort and understanding that reading and writing give us got me through so many things. I will tell you that I wrote disappearing grandmother stories for years. I used to just change the settings. It'd be like Victorian grandmother gone, like little girl's life gets better. You know, Amazon jungle grandmother gone, little girl's life gets better. I just switch, switch, switch. I got into middle school. I started writing stories that explored the mysteries of female friendships which could be confusing. Why was Karen Heck my best friend at homeroom, but wouldn't sit with me at lunch? These things would drive me crazy. So I wrote stories about it. High school, I started writing about boys. You know, they were pretty confusing and mysterious. For example, Jerry Vadnais um, and I had the best date ever, you know, still on record. We went to see Paper Moon, and then we went to Friendly's for Hot Fudge Sundays. All of this is dutifully recorded in a scrapbook I have from 1971. Um, and then he never called me again. And I just would walk by him like, Jerry, Jerry. So I wrote a story in which he was drafted, and I felt so much better. <laughs> um, now, because I'm Italian, I'm very superstitious, so nothing happened beyond getting drafted. I just, and no harm ever came to those grandmothers. They just disappeared. But just having that power of storytelling was great. Um, I majored in English in, in um, college, mostly because I just wanted to read, not talk to a lot of people, and think about how literature and stories work. So I had the best four years. And then after college, I went to work for TWA as a flight attendant uh, because I thought I needed adventures. Um, I thought 
I hadn't done very much. I'd traveled three times. Other than going to visit my father's family in Indiana, I had gone to Bermuda, the Bahamas, and Brazil. I guess I like things that started with B. Uh, and that was it. But I knew there was a big world out there. And I thought, to be a writer, you have to do things like run with the bulls, jump naked in fountains in Paris. Um, I learned pretty quickly that really Eudora Welty was more correct when she said, all a writer has to do is stand on her own front porch. Um, but at 21 years old, I didn't understand that. And off I went. And I flew for TWA for eight years um, and loved every minute of it. People say, oh, that must have been terrible. I'm like, are you kidding me? I, even if I had a crabby passenger, I never saw that person again. And I was in Athens at the end of it. You know, that was pretty good. I loved it. Uh, but this is the first time that this dual comfort system that I had developed at a young age came into question or was tested, I guess. Uh, while I was a flight attendant, my only sibling, my brother Skip, uh, whose book I had read when I was four, uh, died in a household accident while I was on a layover in Los Angeles. And I came home, and I remember standing on the front stoop of my house and looking in the window. It was June, the end of June, really hot. And I noticed that my father had on a flannel shirt, and he had pulled out the Jack Daniels that he only pulled out when someone died, and that's when I realized it had really happened. And I thought, if I don't walk in, everything's the same. Once I walk in, my whole world's going to change. But while I'm on this side of the door, everything's the same. But of course, my, my dear friend Jane, we've been friends since we were 11. She was the one who picked me up at Logan Airport and brought me home, uh, was pushing me through because you can't stop time like that. Of course, you all know that. Uh, so I spent that very hot summer with my parents, hoping I could help to mend their broken hearts. Um, but my wonderful mother in August told me, get the hell out of here. Go live your life. You can't sit here and take care of us forever. Um, I had been scheduled for a big transfer to international flights at Kennedy Airport when my brother died. I had an apartment set up on West 4th Street in Greenwich Village. I had stopped all that. So I found a tiny apartment on Sullivan Street. Oh my gosh, there was someone there last night who was like, I lived in that building. She said 224 Sullivan. She lived in my building. It was so weird. Um, it was a former convent, so the apartments were teeny tiny. They had a fireplace, oddly, but no room. I mean, they were the size of, well, a nun's room, you know, little. And I sublet it from a woman named Heather, who was a dancer. And at night, drunken men would come below the window and yell, Heather, <laughs> Heather. Thank you. Wonderful lullaby. So my boyfriend moved me in. All I had was a hefty trash bag with my clothes, $1,000 in my jeans pocket. Uh, he moved me in, and then he went off to do whatever he had to do. And I sat on the bed, and I thought, oh my goodness, I live in New York City. I don't even know where I live. I know nothing about this place. OK, finish your novel. The novel I had been writing for about four years, called The Betrayal of Sam Pepper, the worst novel maybe ever written. Gratefully, luckily, never published. Um, I pulled it out, and I began to read it, and I thought, this is terrible. I imitated every writer who I had read in the past four years, so the style was all over the place. Um, I, it was a revenge novel, which never works, really, about my neighbor. And like her name was Terry, so in the book I called her Sherry. And it was so bad. I, I, can't, even, I can't even confess to you more of how bad it was. I picked it up, and I threw it in the dumpster on Sullivan Street. Hundreds and hundreds, I mean, maybe five or 600 pages, dumped it in. Went upstairs and thought, OK, you are a reader, most importantly. Why do people read? They read, as Joseph Conrad said, to understand the human condition. You just had one of the biggest, most enormous, horrible things happen to your family. Write about that and write about what that loss feels like. And I typed a sentence. It was, to Sparrow, her father was a man standing in front of a lime green Volkswagen van in 1969. And that book grew from that sentence, and that is the first line of my first novel, Somewhere Off the Coast of Maine. Um, before I knew it, um, I was a full-time writer, the thing I had dreamed about, that everyone in my town thought I might as well have said, I'm going to go to Mars. No one knew in my poor, you know, uh, ec economically and socially depressed town how to help someone become a writer. Somehow, just being an autodidact, 
reading and writing all the time, deconstructing everything I read with notes in the margins to figure out how to tell a story. I found myself in 1987 living the dream I'd hoped for. I was a full-time writer. Uh, TWA went on strike, and I am not exaggerating when I tell you in one week, I went from asking people chicken or beef to being asked, how did you get the idea for your novel? My life changed that quickly. Uh, so I found myself a full-time novelist, uh, and years later, I re-met someone I had known back in Rhode Island. We got married. I moved, left New York City, moved back to Providence, and we had two children, Sam and Grace. And in 2002, Sam was eight and Grace was five. And I had gone off to the Virginia Festival of the Book at the University of Virginia, which is just a wonderful weekend of celebrating writers and writing. And I went there, and uh, came, when I came back, it had gotten really hot. Now, we're New Englanders for April. Like, we had snow this year, right? But this April, it was like the temperatures were around the 90s. It was very weird. And I got back, and I pulled into the driveway, and my then-husband was grilling dinner, and my son was setting the table, and Grace, who was five, she looked up when I came in, and she went to the garden, and she picked a bouquet of chives. You know, if you don't pick them, they get those purple flowers. And normally, when I got home, I leaped out of the car. I was so excited to see my kids. Um, but for some reason that day, I sat in the car, and I just looked at them. And I just took a moment to feel the gratitude I felt for being someone who had been told you can't become a writer to being a published best-selling writer, uh, to having this added bonus of these children, which I had never even wanted children, and then I had these great ones, you know. Um, and I just had this gratitude wash over me. 36 hours later, Grace died suddenly from a virulent form of strep throat. We took her to the hospital with a very high fever, never imagining we would not bring her home again. Uh, after she died, we got Sam, who was staying with a friend. We came home. The three of us got in bed together, uh, holding on to the sides like we were on a ship without a rudder, because in fact we were. I remember being so angry that the sun had the audacity to shine the next morning. I couldn't believe my neighbors would go to work, that the students who lived around me would still go to classes. I couldn't believe that the world could continue when ours had come to such an awful halt. So many of you are nodding because this is what humans experience. We've all had our world stop. Um, I went downstairs eventually, and I picked up the newspaper on the front stoop uh, with no intention of reading it. I was just sort of on automatic. Pulled it out of its blue plastic bag, and sat down and looked, and for the first time since I was four and saw those beautiful words, look, look, I could not read. Uh, I could certainly pick out a word here and there, but it, they made no sense. And so when I most needed language and stories, uh, they abandoned me. I was not able to read or write for two years. And it was during that time that a very wise friend suggested I learn to knit. I will not go on and on about knitting, though I could. Um, and I always say that raising Sam and knitting got me through. Because you know, guys, you all know this, you don't get over grief, you just walk through. And somehow you're on the other side. Um, but you can't even tell how. One day I was sitting in my living room knitting, because that was basically all I did, and I had a weird thought, which is I wish I could teach everybody to knit. Um, there'd be no more war, and people would not have high blood pressure, and we would all have scarves and mittens, it'd be lovely. <laughs> And then I thought, that's a ridiculous idea. But my next thought was, I can write a book about the magic of knitting. And I called my agent, and I said, uh, I'm writing a novel. She cried. She said, I knew you'd write again. What's it about? And I said, it's about seven women in a knitting circle. And there was a giant pause. <laughs> and she said, and they knit? <laughs> and I said, yes. And there was a bigger pause. And she said, for like 300 pages. <laughs> that book became my novel, The Knitting Circle. I had not had a book out in almost five years. Uh, but that sort of got me back into my world of storytelling and reading. Um, my next idea for a novel was about a woman who rediscovers the magic of reading, because that's what I had lost. 
but I could hear that same agent. A book about a woman who knits, now you're gonna write a book about a woman who reads. <laughs> What's next, a woman who sleeps? I mean, <laughs> you know, can your characters do something? So I sort of tucked the idea away, and actually I wrote three other books before I was coming home from a book club. It was about an hour's drive, and this book club had met for 30 years, and they had gotten through everything with each other, uh, both triumphant things and tragedies, and they stuck together, joined together by the magic of language and stories. And by the time I got home from that book club, I had about two-thirds of this book, the book that matters most, figured out. Uh, in which a woman joins a book club at a cri time of crisis in her life, rediscovers the joy of books and storytelling and language, and is able to move forward. Um, in order to write that book, I asked everybody who crossed my path, what is the book that matters most to you? Which is a different question than what's your favorite book, right? And I bought notebooks and pens, because I, whenever I start a book, I just buy a lot of like index cards and highlighters that I never use, but I just feel like I want this stuff on my desk. And I had all these notebooks, and I thought, I'm going to fill them. I'm going to get so many ideas, so many book recommendations. When, in fact, I realized pretty quickly that the same 26 books came up far more than any other book. Um, and so I relented after three or four months of this. And although there were some outliers, these 26 really were, seemed to be the books that mattered most to most people. And I asked a pretty wide range from neighbors to other writers, filmmakers, parents of my kids' friends. You know, just it was a very wide range of, of not a very scientific endeavor. Uh, the number one answer was To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, usually followed by that's the book that turned me into a reader. Um, Jane Austen was big. Tolstoy was bigger. Uh, Dickens was biggest in that group. Um, Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights both came up. I really wanted to be sure to include international books as well as American books. I wanted a broad range, so all I could do was read the 26 books, uh, reread them. I, and I'm sorry if this is your favorite book, the thing I was most grateful for was No One Said Moby Dick. I just <laughs> cannot get, wrap my brain around that book. But I reread all the others, Moby Dick was not on there. Um, it took me one year to reread 26 books. Um, people liked a lot of fat ones. We had Anna Karenina, you know, War and Peace, all those Jane Austens, 100 Years of Solitude. And then I chose from those 26, 10 books for my fictional book club, who is asked what book matters most to you because that's what they were gonna read that year. I picked the 10 books and then I created characters who would pick those books. So I did, wrote this book a little bit backwards. Typically I start with the character, but I wanted to know who would really pick The Great Gatsby, who would pick 100 Years of Solitude, who would pick Catcher in the Rye. Um, so it took me a year. So this book took me five years to write. They typically take two or three years. But that research was pretty lengthy. Uh, the book came out, and you would think after 30 years of writing and publishing, I would anticipate the question every interviewer asked me, which was, Anne Hood, what book matters most to you? And the question came, and I was like, uh, 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 huh. Um, and then I heard myself on the radio, live, blurt, Marjorie Morningstar. And my thought, you know, in my little thought bubble was, you idiot, pick a literary book. Not Marjorie Morningstar, next time say The Great Gatsby, you know. And the next interview was about 15 minutes later on the radio. You know, you can sit in your pajamas on your bed and do this. And what, at the end, what book matters most to you? Marjorie Morningstar, I say. I'm like, okay, wait, why am I saying that, you know? So I reread Marjorie Morningstar, and by rereading it, I rediscovered the magic of books, just as, you know, I wanted to. I time traveled back to 1972 in my teenage room uh, with the yellow and white gingham curtains and matching bedspread, all my posters, like make love not war kind of posters, my record player, my stack of Simon and Garfunkel albums, uh, the, the beads that I spent one whole summer stringing for my doorway, but my parents wouldn't let me take the door off, so I had the beads in the door, which was <laughs> not the effect I went for, but that's what I got. And I remembered who I was when I read Marjorie Morningstar and why it mattered so much to me. And I wrote an essay about it 
that grew into 10 essays, about 10 books that I read in high school that kind of helped me make a blueprint for my life. And so Morning Star, Growing Up With Books, the nonfiction one, followed the book that matters most on that path. Um, I was so happy uh, when the book that matters most came out. I visited 77 book clubs in six weeks. Um, about number 42, I thought I was going to die. And like, I would remind myself, look, you're on an airplane and you're in a nice hotel, but it didn't matter. I was like, I'm so tired of people and books and this book and Catcher in the Rye and everything else I'm talking about. Um, and I almost canceled, but I'm not a canceler. Like, I'm just type A, you know, I, I do everything I'm supposed to do. Um, so I almost canceled uh, this book club in Queens because I had done a book club in New Jersey, right from there flew to Sarasota, Florida, did a reading at a bookstore, two book clubs, a book club in St. Petersburg, a book club in Tallahassee, a book club in Gainesville, flew home that night, did a book club in Brooklyn, and then it's the next night and I have to do one in Queens. And although I have lived many, many years in New York City, to me Queens is still sort of just like right up there, except it's super big. And this was really far away, Queens, the Uber was $142, that's how far away it was. And I dragged my husband with me, he had already been to like 70 of these book clubs, he was like, oh please, you know, stop. And I said, I have to go, and I get in, and I immediately fall in love, which I did with every book club I visited. It was run by an 85-year-old matriarch. All of the members were either her daughter, her daughter-in-law, her niece, her goddaughter. They were lovely, they had great wine, which is really critical if you are hosting <laughs> a very beleaguered, tired writer, you know. They had good food, and then they had done this wonderful thing, which is they had brought the book that mattered most to them, a copy of it, to show me. And this person brings up a book called Top. It's about a dog. You read it in first grade. I'd never heard of it. It's really falling apart, you know, and beautiful, and like looks like it's from the 50s, which it was. And the next person has a copy of Jane Eyre that she read for the first time at the age of 12 and rereads every year and writes the date in the back. So there are pages of the date in different inks, and, you know, one's, you know, dotted with a daisy, you know, at some point. And, uh, and so on and so on, and then it gets to the last person, and she brings out my memoir about Grace dying, Comfort, as the book that mattered most to her because her son had died. At which point I start to cry, and they, they practically have to carry me out of there. I'm just like so overwhelmed, yes, exhausted. But I realized, oh yes, this is how much books matter. This is how much books matter, and how we must never forget and so when I wrote this book, I hoped that you would all remind yourselves of the magic of storytelling and the magic of books, but that you would also remember that day when whatever your version of this is, you opened a book and you read those words, look, look, and then your life began. So I'm going to read a little bit from this book. Uh, my main character is named Ava, and um, her husband leaves her. I always have to get a little knitting thing in, so she, he leaves her for a yarn bomber. If you don't know what it is, <laughs> it's a real thing. It is someone who uh, knits public things, like the Statue of David, or Volkswagens, or a phone book booth in London. And uh, so she's kind of always in the news, which is driving Ava crazy. Um, she used to be a huge reader. Her mother, in fact, owned a bookstore, but a double tragedy in her youth uh, kept her away from reading. And so this is um, the first book club, uh, the first meeting when she's been told she has to read Pride and Prejudice, and she tries, and she just doesn't have good concentration because she's really a mess, and so she watches the movie <laughs> and thinks no one will know. Ava tried to concentrate on the descriptions of the social milieu of Regency England and the class divisions, but her mind kept wandering. Her ex-husband Jim was back from Peru. She knew because she'd spotted his reliable blue Prius on her way to the library, parked just two blocks from home. For a silly moment, she hoped he'd park there and then walk to their old house, maybe to see her, maybe to reconsider moving out out of their house, out of her life. All of it so swift she was still reeling from it. But as soon as she had the thought, she dismissed it. There were countless reasons for him to be in their neighborhood. 
Ava had to work hard now to blot out the image of the bumper of Jim's Prius, yarn bombed in pale pink yarn. I think it's important to say, Penny said, standing and peering at the group through her thick bifocals, that although Ms. Austin is critical of the upper crust, she also does a good job of satirizing the lower class. Ava sat up straighter. They'd started the discussion. Apparently she daydreamed through the introduction and missed the beginning. Well, Ruth said, in her lifetime, England did restrict social mobility, didn't they? In her lifetime, Jen said, we restrict social mobility today, too. I suppose that's true, Penny said, but I was from old Boston stock, and I married the son of mill workers. Ava forced herself to focus. In the movie, she'd like the overly romantic scene when Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy met up in the rain, but that didn't seem to add anything to this discussion. Then she sensed a pause. The character of Elizabeth is curious, she said into the space of quiet. She's so ill-tempered and rude, yet I think we're meant to like her. Jennifer was frowning at Ava. Actually, Kate said carefully, Elizabeth is quite sweet-natured. Now Ava was frowning. Had she mixed up, mixed up the characters? No, Kira Knightley was Elizabeth. She was sure of that. <laughs> the discussion got directed to another topic about Austin's relevance today but Jennifer kept glaring at Ava. The actress Diana said she hadn't been able to stop reading to see if Elizabeth would end up with Darcy. Oh, I knew they'd end up together from the start, Ava said, happy for another opportunity. The way Elizabeth looks at him, at that first ball, you just know. The first ball, Kiki said? Wait a minute, you're talking about the movie with Kira Knightley? Ava squirmed in her seat. In the movie, Kiki explained, Elizabeth totally telegraphs her interest in Mr. Darcy as soon as they meet. Ava heard Luke chuckle beside her. John stood and cleared his throat. Now, I'm not going to say I didn't have some trouble with this when he said, but it seems to me that men during that time had lots of options, but women didn't. They had only one, a good marriage. Relieved that everyone seemed to have forgotten about her, Ava stayed quiet. As they turned from her and their chatter filled the air, Ava felt a spark of something inside her take hold. She would find Rosalind Arden, the woman who had writ written the young adult book that mattered most to her when she was a kid. She would tell her how, as a sad little girl, she'd read that book over and over for an entire summer. Could a writer understand how her book had saved someone long ago? when the world was a fragile, scary place and the people she loved weren't in it anymore? Could a writer understand that her book had mattered more than anything? Ava didn't know the answer, but she was going to find out. She would find Rosalind Arden and she would tell her everything. Just the thought of that lifted her spirits and allowed her to join the people beside her who were happily talking about books. Thanks. This is the Q&A portion of the program. Wh what do we have, like 15 minutes, Marilyn? Yeah. yeah. OK, like 15 minutes. So. Ah. Oh, because then I have to sign books. Oh, so five, but we, we'll do 10. Don't tell Marilyn. OK. <laughs> so any questions? Yes. Yep. So, so she's saying, how do you start the book? Like the first page is so important because when she looks at a book and decides, do I want to read it? She looks at the first page. Um, so um, I never studied writing. I always confess that I don't have an MFA. Uh, I, I studied literature. I have a master's in American literature uh, and, you know, a bachelor's in English. Uh, so my, my approach is very much from that standpoint and not from like what you're taught in writing workshops, so I don't know if it's good advice or not. But what I know, I, I have two thoughts. The first is I feel like every story is really the odyssey. Your main character is trying to get home and can't. 
You know, Kurt Vonnegut has this wonderful line of, I could write a whole novel about a man who wants a drink of water as long as he can't get it. <laughs> and so you sort of have to think about what's this odyssey? You know, what does your main character want that they can't get? And then you somehow have to, on the first page, tell the reader just about everything without the reader realizing they're being told that. Uh, and so it takes me months to write my first sentence um, and then my first page. It takes me even more months to get to about page 70. But something magical happens around page 70 or 75 when I can keep going. But I'm really a lot of fits and starts until around page 75. Um, so the first page, what I know is the first line is going to describe the main character and also tell the reader um, at the end of the quest, this character is going to be at a complete opposite place. And so, for example, in the knitting circle, it took me months to come up with a line that's not going to win any prizes, but I was trying to describe a woman who had lost everything and had nothing to give. And the line is simply, Mary showed up empty-handed. What's really important in that very short sentence is it's the day she showed up, the day before she couldn't get out of bed. So now we know something's about to change. Once I knew that first line, I knew it had to end, the book had to end on abundance. If she's empty-handed in line one, she's overflowing at the end. So that's kind of how I do it. And then you have like 300 pages in between that you have no idea what they're gonna be, but you have <laughs> sort of a start and end, you know. Yeah. So going back to your character development, how much time do you spend developing all the characters before you write the story? How much time do I spend developing characters before I write the story? So I have to know my protagonist. So although the people in the book club grew out of books that I chose for them to choose, I knew the main character. So on that ride back from the bookstore, her story revealed itself to me in a way. And I am not like woo woo, sit on a hilltop and wait for the muse to come. I don't like all of that. I'm very sort of practical when I write. So I don't want you to think I was like divine intervention came and told me what to write. But it was more like, okay, a woman in crisis. Uh, what's a crisis that a woman in middle age goes through? Well, divorce. I mean, that, you know, that came to me right away. I wanted her to have a daughter who at that car ride, I thought, is every mother's worst nightmare. I didn't know what that meant yet. Um, and Ava's story kind of unfolded, and I wanted her to have something from her past that joining this book club was going to crack open. And so a lot of character work, if you can consider an hour driving, a lot. Uh, of course, there was much more as I wrote, but I had a real sense of what her conflict was, what was at stake, um, and that she had something from her past. So the protagonist has to be pretty real to me, and that I have to understand their story and I, I like what John Irving said, you know, he's a big fan of Dickens. And he says, I don't understand when writers don't care about plot, like plot is story, and from plot come characters. And I think I kind of agree with that idea. So I do a lot of work on what's gonna happen when, and then that helps me realize how the character's gonna grow. Yes? Do I know the characters before I start? Um, I know the protagonist. And I know pretty much a cast of characters, but that changes a lot because I think, I know there's writers here, you'll agree that sometimes you want these five people, but really you can conflate them. You don't need a five or, like you want a lot of siblings because maybe you had a lot of siblings, but you realize in fiction that doesn't always work and you can actually conflate them. So I know the main characters for sure. The other stuff does change a little bit. I think we have time for like one more question. Yes, one more. Mm-hmm. Well, my son was eight. Yeah, well, my son was eight, so he wasn't really a man. He was a little boy who lost his sibling and his best friend, and there are still many repercussions from that. It's, I mean, he would tell his story however he would tell it. Um, my then-husband um, 
did do a lot of things that were stereotypically male, uh, gr with male and grief. You know, like I went to a grief counselor, he wouldn't go. She laid out, if he's not gonna go to a grief counselor in two years, this is what's gonna happen, and it's exactly what happened. You know, he went back to work uh, right away. Um, I mean, he did a lot of wonderful things, and he was grieving hard, but he did some very stereotypical or typical things, and in two years, he completely fell apart. Yeah. I know that's the last question, but it's such a downer. Does, you want one happy? <laughs> no, no happy? Okay, I'll just go in. Thank you so much, everybody.